My name is Piers Simpkin. They call me Mutuyangamia. And today we're visiting my herd here at Nakuru County. Did you know that camels are not only animals that are good for the desert, but they're also fantastic milk producers? This is my story. I've been keeping camels for quite a long time. Um, I did, when I was finished university, I started doing research on camels up in northern Kenya, looking at their potential as a food supplier. So that was back in the early 1980s. And from that time, I started buying a few camels, keeping them. I then worked with projects which were teaching people about better camel management. I went on to do a doctorate on camel milk production based on our research here in Kenya. And then since then, we've now tried to turn it into much more of a commercial camel dairy production system. What stood out for me was that the fact that climate change and Kenya is a large part is arid and semi-arid and the perfect animal for those conditions is the camel. Um, they produce more milk than the local cattle under desert conditions. They're very drought tolerant and they can survive and continue producing milk throughout the droughts while cattle and sheep and goats are even dying. And that's where the real advantage of the camel comes because it's producing very constant amounts of milk. Um, here I would say our average of a good camel is 8 litres per day over a 12 month lactation. Now when you're in a drought they don't get pregnant because they're seasonal breeders and a camel will continue lactating throughout a drought until the rains come, until it gets pregnant, then the milk will dry up. So they can even produce milk for up to two years. The amount of milk we're actually selling is much less than that eight litres. That's the, the total that the calf consumes combined with what we're selling per day from a good camel. One of the big problems that the pastoralist communities are facing is really getting access to the markets. Um, therefore, camel milk has largely just been for sustaining the household, feeding the family. It is highly nutritious, but it's also highly valuable. But with the pastoralist system, where the herds are very widespread across the environment and across the different counties, it's very difficult to get that milk fresh to where it's needed. Um, so there is a market in Nairobi, there are markets also in some of the other towns, even here in Nakuru. Um, but getting the milk from those pastoralist herds is very difficult for them because of the transport costs, the distances involved and also the hygiene issues. And there are many opportunities within the, the camel value chain. Milk is the primary one. That is what everybody is looking for and people enjoy the most. And particularly the fresh milk. However, there are also opportunities in, in the yogurts and the traditional susa, the fermented milk. And some people have even been trying to make ice cream and chocolates out of the milk. Not so much here in Kenya, but in the Middle East. So here in Kenya, it's very much the fresh milk market or the yogurt market. And there are already two dairies in Kenya producing good, high quality fresh milk, which is pasteurized and sold in the shops. Uh, that's white gold and noug dairies. And they're also producing flavored yogurts as well, which are very popular in the market here in Kenya. Probably secondly is the meat. It's generally cheaper than beef, um, but it's a, a high quality meat, very lean, low cholesterol meat as well. Um, and then thirdly, the hides and the skins, uh, which very few hides and skins are actually processed here in Kenya, although it does produce a good quality leather. That's something that's really lacking in, in the Kenya system is linking up the abattoirs and the camel owners to the leather industry. And then of course there's ecotourism, camel riding, uh, going on camel walks, camel safaris. Um, so there's several aspects to the value chain and all of them are really waiting to be exploited more fully. So that's one of the exciting things about camel farming. There is a lot more opportunity there than perhaps with the normal dairy sector such as cow's milk. Camel's milk has been found to be very nutritious. It's got a very high vitamin C content which is obviously not only important to the pastoralists who don't get access to fruit and vegetables, um, but it's also good for the nutrition even of people living in towns. It's also, it's got a similar fat content to cow's milk, but it has a different sort of fat. 
um, different short-chain fatty acids, long-chain fatty acids, and it's also got a different lactose component compared to cow's milk. So many people who are lactose intolerant and cannot drink dairy products, often many of them can still drink camel's milk. So it's very good for the children who might be lactose intolerant. The milk itself has antimicrobial elements in it. Some people also claim antiviral components into it. Um, and again, there are various aspects in terms of managing people's health. Uh, there's research being done in terms of its control of diabetes, helping to manage blood sugar levels. And if people are drinking camel's milk, it can maintain a more even blood sugar level. It won't cure you of anything. It won't cure you of diabetes, but it is highly nutritious. And that obviously helps in, in, the, in, the, in the people's health and well-being. Um, so the milk itself does have some properties which are very favourable and is opening up a new market for people as well. The whole economics of camel keeping is quite a challenge. The investment into camel keeping is high because you need to buy a good number of female animals. However, once you've actually got the animals, they're very easy to maintain. Providing you have space, you have grazing or access to grazing, um, and you can pay grazing fees in order to ensure you get good quality grazing, then there's no need for supplementation. If you supplement, you can indeed increase milk yields, but you also are introducing the risk of aflatoxins, etc., into the feed and into the milk. Whereas if you're free ranging, you've got absolutely pure, healthy milk from a range of different natural plants. So that's sometimes why people think it's very therapeutic. Our main costs here are the herding costs, and that costs that 56% of our outgoings are in paying salaries to people. Uh, the next expense is mineral costs. Um, and, uh, camels like salt and here in Nakuru there's a, a mineral imbalance so we have to buy extra special uh, minerals with a better balance of uh, cobalt, copper and selenium to overcome the local deficiencies here. And then also uh, additional costs of the grazing fees, that is 16% of my costs going grazing fees to the ranch where we're currently host, which currently host us. We're paying a grazing fee of 250 shillings per month per adult camel and that covers their grazing and the watering costs. Camels don't need a lot of water, although they have a reputation for huge drinking. Uh, over time, they, the, if you actually compare them to cattle and sheep and goats, the amount of water they drink per day is much, much lower. So they don't have huge watering costs. They don't have so many veterinary challenges. The, the diseases camels get are not as many as cattle. Um, they're often immune to many of the foot and mouth diseases. So we're not really vaccinating. We're not really having to treat with many antibiotics, just occasionally. So that only comes up to about four or 6% of my expenditure. Uh, we also have an insurance scheme to cover staff in case they're injured by the animals because as you can see they're quite large beasts dealing with them. Uh, there's a certain amount of risk involved but as it's the same as with cattle. So we're just making sure that we're fulfilling all of the requirements of, of employment here in Kenya. Anybody who really wants to venture into this business is, is really study the market first of all. And I can say this, I think, for any agribusiness, is really look at the market. What is the opportunity? And then what are your costs of production going to be? Here we've, we've learned, even though we have a large herd of over 100 camels, I believe that to be cost effective in a, in a commercial camel dairy business here, you need at least 25 lactating female camels at any one time. That means you have to have a herd of 50 females, adult females because they only carve once every two years. So you have half of them lactating, half of them pregnant. And then you'll be breaking even. And the profits will come from your growing herd. The number of calves produced, they will grow in value year by year, and that's what makes it profitable. But if you're going in with only one or two animals, if you don't have a local market right on your doorstep, then you're not really going to be commercially viable. And also there are risks if you're dependent on a larger community of 
For example, many of the cooperatives in, in northern Kenya, which were mass producing camel's milk for the Nairobi market, you have to ensure the quality of your milk. And if you have 100 or 200 producers, each producing just five liters each, it's very difficult to control the quality. At least here we have, it's under one management system. Uh, we know what drugs are going in. We, we keep to the withdrawal periods. And so there's no risk of any contamination in that milk. But if you're working as a cooperative, you really have to be able to ensure the quality of your milk. So if you're going in, try and go in large scale. Um, when we're talking on a global scale, large scale involves about 3,000 milking camels. So if you look at the dairies in the Middle East, in Alain and Dubai, they will have 3,000 adult female camels, and that's what's making them commercially viable. Here in Kenya, um, with the smaller market, then I reckon if you have 50 lactating or 50 adult female camels, then you can start bulking up your milk, sending it into the towns, the nearest urban centers. But below that, it is a struggle. And even for us, it's still a struggle. Um, but in terms of the market, we, in the past, we've been trying to sell the milk ourselves. Um, we'll have an agent who would buy it, take it to Nairobi for sale. But then often at the end of the month, the payments wouldn't be made. So again, we've lost hundreds of thousands of shillings in the past in terms of having a value, a, a reliable, value chain system. Um, it's difficult for us as producers to also do the end marketing. We're not reaching that scale yet. In time we'd like to have our own small dairy processing centre. It would have to be mobile or it would have to be an area where the animals are always close to. Um, but I think that's also much more the future, having small scale mobile dairy facilities so that when the animals have to move to fresh grazing your, your processing plant can be near them. It could be solar driven, you can have a small pasteurization process, a chilling process, all driven by solar, and then you could actually get it to the market in good condition. So there are still some shortfalls, there are still challenges, I'm sure there still will be more in the future, um, but that's part of farming and one has to really be aware of what those challenges are, what the risks are, and that's the main analysis. Before you get involved, before you commit your finances, make sure you know what the risks and the opportunities are. Camel farming, I think, is, is a long-term commitment. Um, the question is, is how patient are the youth? A lot of youth today really want to see quick returns and perhaps moving into poultry or some of the even fodder production, for example, the quick return crops where there's money to be made, and that might be suitable to the youth. But again, youth don't often have access to land. So that's another big challenge. But you can, if you negotiate, and if you pay, you're willing to pay for grazing, and you put that into your business plan, then again, it can be part of the business. One of the big challenges of camels is they're very slow. So you only get one calf every two years. So although a camel produces much more milk than the local cow, it, it's, it cannot compete with a purebred Frisian or dairy cow. But for free-ranging livestock, they're producing probably five times the volume of milk. The value of that milk is probably also four or five times more than cow's milk. And so there are opportunities there. But then again, they're very slow growing. From these young calves, it'll take five years before they're producing milk. So you have all of those costs until you've actually got a productive animal. So there is potential there and they're so hardy, very disease tolerant or resistant. And so once you've got them and you've built up a big enough herd, then you have opportunities. But it's also getting it to market is the main challenge. And that is my story. I'd be really interested to hearing what you yourselves are doing in agriculture and agribusiness here in Kenya. So share your story. From camel breeding and production to processing camel milk, another white gold. Next week, we meet with an agripreneur who relocated back home from the States to start a camel milk processing plant. Before that story is up, remember to share and don't forget to subscribe.